Hi, everybody. This is Chris Carosa, publisher of the Minion Honey Eye Falls Lima Sentinel, welcoming you to this wonderful holiday special. That's right. Today we have Tim and Deb Smith, or should I say tonight? Whatever. It's a magic night. It's the solstice. It's the conjunction. It's all these cool things. And one of those cool things that's here with us right now are Tim and Deb Smith. I guess that's two cool things. You might know Tim and Deb Smith from our newspaper, The Sentinel, where they publish frequently in every issue and tell you wonderful stories that excite you and just get you going and wondering, what the, how did they think of that? I mean, these are the sort of stories that they tell. Well, they put some of the best of the stories in their latest book, Tit for Tat Exchanges. Tim, oh, look, it disappears when I go that way. It's Tim and Deb's latest book, and you can get it from them if you contact them directly. They'll even autograph it for you, and you'll be happy. You'll be able to go. If you need it right now as a Christmas gift, you can do that, and bam, you can have it right away. Otherwise, you can order it from your favorite bookstore, Amazon, or wherever. You can go wherever you want. So Tim and Deb are going to talk a little bit about some of the stories that they've written about, maybe some that haven't been published yet, maybe something that you haven't heard about, but it'll be a lot of fun. And I'll turn it over to them right now, and they can go ahead and share their screen and get going. Here you go, Tim and Deb, go ahead. Hi, we're Deb and Tim Smith, and we're here to talk about the book we've written called Tip for Tad Exchanges, Tim and Deb's Greatest Hits. Just to explain that title and our various book and newspaper writing projects, we've written about 2 million words so far, and this book represents what we thought were our best 50,000. So that's where the greatest hits terminology comes from. Since 2015, we've written the weekly back page feature for our local newspaper, the Mendon Honey F. Falls Lima Sentinel. And our content covers an eclectic range of topics, including music, sports, travel, and human interest. We've had some adventures and we'll share some highlights with you tonight. Here's our quick backstory. We dated for all four years of high school, then went to different colleges and I ended up not seeing each other again for literally 40 years when my mom passed away. Deb heard about it through the grapevine in Virginia Beach where she was teaching. She wrote me, I wrote her back. One thing led to another and after she finished her school year, I went down to Virginia and brought her back home. And now we're married and living happily ever after in beautiful downtown Menden. Well, I wanna add one piece to this. During our courtship time when I was in Virginia, Every day when I went to my mailbox, there would be an envelope waiting for me from Tim and it have a letter that I had written to him 40 years ago. He saved them all. Took me a long time to play those cards. Here's the explanation on how we came up with the title of our book. We were writing an article about Easter Island and a dispute between the territory and its mother country of Chile was described as a tit for tat exchange. That scenario gave us pause to ponder. Isn't tit for tat such an interesting little colloquialism? And we got to thinking, what exactly is tat? How do I get some? And where can I turn it in for the other thing? So many people commented about that line that we decided to use it as the lead for our title. It's kind of ironic how the whole COVID thing has affected our writing. It opened up this avenue of communication which we had never used before. And because we couldn't do much else, we had lots of time to write. This is the second book we've had published. The third one is completely done. It will be out soon. And we have a fourth one, which will be hitting the presses by the end of next year. So if you like what you see and hear from us, we'll have more on the way for you. So at this point, we'll start to share some highlights from Tit for Tat. We have one chapter called Endangered Babies, which has three components. And here's our favorite. Check out this statue called the Child Eater of Bern which sits in the main square of the city in Bern, Switzerland. If you ever want to scare the crap out of your kids, take them to Bern to see this fountain statue of the child leader. The statue, which was built in 1546, stands right in the middle of town and depicts a giant ogre, teeth bared, with a baby half stuffed into its gaping mouth. This looks to be the appetizer in a four course meal as the ogre has another baby cradled under his left arm and two more stuffed into a sack. The anguished looks on the faces of the uneaten children seem to be conveying the notion that they realize the invention of the baby monitor is centuries away from helping them out of this impending demise. And as if the whole concept of this statue was not already bizarre enough, there are eight bears, each armed with some kind of weapon, 
marching in a circle around the base. Some of the bears are looking up as if they are observing the ogre, ingesting the scrum diddlyumptious children, hoping against hope that perhaps an appendage or two might fall their way. Whatever the child eater or burn was originally meant to represent, the result we are left with today is a culinary nightmare of every kid in the world. And as opposed to the witch in Hansel and Gretel, this cannibal doesn't even cook the kids. One aspect of our writing that we hope adds to the ambiance is that we sprinkle some poetry throughout the book. Our usual poetic weapon of choice is the limerick. Here's an example. That fair fairy tale wife was a cheater and kid eating, I know I'll beat her. It's clearly the law. You eat the kids raw, or so says the burn child eater. The other two components of our endangered babies chapter are Lithuanian baby racing and the baby jumping festival in Spain. Yes, for your entertainment, we are willing to travel the globe. Another chapter we have is called Historical Hijinks, where we have some fun debunking some of the tried and true history we were all taught. As will be our pattern throughout this presentation, for every chapter, we are going to pick just one little nugget to give you a taste of what this whole book is like. All right. Everyone's familiar with the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem, Paul Revere's Ride which begins with the lines, listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. There is actually so much poppycock in the legend created by this poem that it's kind of fun to take the poem and pound the crap out of it with a history book, which is exactly what we're gonna do here. Here's what Longfellow has wrong in his account of the iconic events which were initiated at the Old North Church in Boston that night of April 18, 1775. On the night in question, the British captured Paul Revere, took his horse, and made him walk home. Here is our history correcting take on the situation from the perspective of Samuel Prescott, the dude who actually did ride through Concord shouting out, the British are coming. Unfortunately for Prescott, his name didn't rhyme with here. All right, so here is our poem that we wrote called Samuel Prescott's Ride. Tis all quite well for kids to hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere, but why should my name be forgot as if Paul rode and I did not? I sallied forth, refused to fail, while Paul Revere, he was in jail. I warned the town and wrote this poem while Paul Revere was walking home. Why not my name? The reason's clear. My name's Prescott and his Revere. We have another chapter called Animal Acts and to highlight that, we're going to take you to a bizarrely delightful tourist attraction, namely the Froggyland Museum, which can be found in Split, Croatia. This museum holds the answers to many questions we feel sure you have probably previously pondered. What would it look like if frogs ran a circus, went to school, or played tennis? How about if you saw them rowing rafts down the river or breaking a turkey wishbone in half? You can find the answer to these quirky questions and many more at the Froggyland Museum. This festival of frogs was the life work of taxidermist Ferenc Mir, who completed his project in 1920. This diverse collection of stuffed frogs posed in everyday situations consists of 507 preserved frogs arranged in 21 cases of dioramas. Equal attention was also given to his props down to the most minute detail. One frog in the classroom scene is raising two fingers to convey he knows the answer. We see frogs at work, for example, sewing here, and frogs at play, sliding right side up and upside down. Another favorite animal story is about the bat bomb, which the US government spent millions of dollars developing before opting to use the atomic bomb to end World War II. The long story short of it is that each of these bombs held a thousand bats, which were going to fly around Japan and start fires in a bizarre scenario we share in the book. We also have a chapter called Justifying the Jim Thorpe Theft. So who exactly is Jim Thorpe and how did he get stolen? Most of our stories are humorous and while we do inject some comedy into this corner, the story itself borders on the bizarre. Jim Thorpe is one of the greatest all around athletes of all time, excelling in the Olympics, the NFL and Major League Baseball in the early 1900s. There's a, a picturesque town in central Pennsylvania that bears his name and his body, but Jim Thorpe never set foot in Jim Thorpe. So why is his body there now? Turns out the town of Jim Thorpe used to be called Mock Chunk, which was a name they weren't particularly happy with. 
And while we can understand why the Monk Chuck Yins might have wanted to change their name, we do have to question their process. In 1952, while Monk Chunk was looking to change his identity, Jim Thorpe died. Unrelated coincidence, right? Well, it started out that way, but that's not how it ended up. In some shady secret negotiations, Jim Thorpe's third wife, to whom he was married at the time of his death, agreed to sell his corpse to Mock Chunk, which enshrined his body and renamed the town Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. This took place against the wishes of Thorpe's eight children in the bizarre details of how this all went down and what's happened since are also in the book. If we were to pick one component of our writing that has been the most rewarding, it would be the concept which we'll address in this next chapter. We have a special needs son named Skylar, and although he does have developmental delays across the board, he oozes charisma and has a great capacity for happiness. He always enjoyed writing stories, and his vivid imagination has contributed to some creative material. We always considered this a blessing as it provided an opportunity for us to work with him on his writing skills using material that he had personally generated. On many occasions, Tim and I would be collaborating on our newest feature, and Skyler would set up shop right next to us and begin to write one of his stories. So at that point, we're awash with parenting perfection as we joyfully modeled intellectual endeavors, which he attempted to emulate. Then one day he came to us and said, I'm working on an article for the paper and I'd like you to let him know I'll have it done by the weekend. This turn of events obviously created a bit of a dilemma for us. We always encouraged his writing, frankly stated the material he generated wasn't going to make it into the paper. So we started thinking, 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 what could an approach be whereby Skyler would be a genuine participant in a three-way writing collaboration that would actually end up in the paper. The lightning bolt emanating from our brainstorm was Skylar Smith's tour of Menden, our hometown. This bolt of brilliance turned out to be quadrilaterally symbiotic, which would be an example of how sometimes we just make up expressions, but we promise to fill you in on what quadrilaterally symbiotic means in a minute. Part of what made the concept so successful was that it was always written through Skylar's point of view. That concept actually opened up some avenues of creative literary opportunity in our writing. When you are viewing the world through the eyes of a child, you are afforded opportunities to address your subject matter with an air of innocent naivete, which would not be possible if you were writing from a truly adult perspective. All right, so returning to that term of quadrilaterally symbiotic, which we kind of made up, the concept benefited so many people, it was remarkable. We broke it down into four basic categories as follows. The local businesses benefited from the exposure. The community in general was entertained, which in turn generated more readers for the newspaper. And finally, Skylar's self-confidence was boosted as he became a semi-celebrity in town. So there's your quadrilaterally symbiotic. Feel free to use it anytime you want. The initial game plan was to have the series run for a few weeks within our feature, which appears on the back page of the paper every week. But the whole thing just kind of exploded and Skylar's com column became its own entity and ran for a hundred weeks. That summer, we began to approach some local businesses and ask them if they would like to have us tell their stories. Our approach became quite uniform. We would generate a list of questions, Skylar would read the questions, I take notes and Tim would supply the comic relief. Then we'd come home and sit around the computer talking and writing it up. I'm a retired high school English teacher and it turned out that one of my former students opened a nail salon in town. So the three of us did an interview with her and she shared the story of one of the greatest lines of my entire teaching career, which happened in her class. Here's the scoop. The go-to high school movie version of Romeo and Juliet has traditionally been Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 classic film, which starred Olivia Hussey as the 14-year-old Juliet. Juliet was played by this amply endowed Olivia Hussey, and for a split second, when she gets up to say goodbye, her bountiful breasts spill out of a robe, and let me put it this way. If the movie had been made in 3D, some people in the front row could have been seriously injured. While the view lasted only a split second, for the 14-year-old boys in that classroom, it was a second that may have lived on for hours or days or weeks. 
When I was typically wrapping up class, I would usually close by asking if anybody had any questions. The, the end of that class, after the big breast scene, was always a little different with the kids kind of looking at each other and waiting and wanting to say something about the risque shot, but not knowing how to do it without coming off as crude or crass. So usually nothing was said, the bell rang and the kids went on their way, but not in that class. One kid finally came up with the perfect way to thread the needle to refocus attention on the scene in question and not get in trouble for it. He raised his hand and with perfect timing and delivery said, Mr. Smith, was Juliet really just 14 years old? Well, a few years ago, we wrote a book about geography where we had a blurb about every country and territory in the world. When we went to put this new book together, it occurred to us that from the hundreds of ge geography blurbs we had already written, we should pick our favorite 10 and give them a chapter. So of those 10 stories, we thought we'd just pick one to share with you tonight. How about we take a trip to the Cocos Keeling Islands, which are located in the Indian Oceans. The islands were first visited in 1825 by two separate parties from England. The first was Captain John Clooney's Ross, who stopped at the islands on a trip to India, nailed up a Union Jack and made plans to return with his wife, kids and mother-in-law to settle on the islands. Meanwhile, Alexander Hare, who, although he had become rich as a politician in Malaysia, decided he, quote, could not confine himself to the tame life that civilization afforded. He subsequently acquired a harem of 40 Malay women and moved the whole party to the islands. Sounds like a fun guy, right? Well, frivolity ensued, but not for long. The Malaysian harem hoedown was not the healthy habitat Kunis Ross had envisioned for his family. And upon his return, the pair of men clashed immediately. The deciding factor in the conflict turned out to be that Clooney's Ross had also brought eight sailors with his family and the sailors, and this is their quote, began at once the invasion of the new kingdom to take possession of it, women and all. Well, after some time, Hare's harem began deserting him and instead finding themselves mates amongst Clooney Ross's sailors. Disheartened, Hare left the island and returned to the mundane world of politics. It's always tough to leave a harem behind, but sometimes a man's got to do what a man's got to do. So going back to the story of its earliest inhabitants, perhaps the greatest lesson to be learned from the saga of the Cocos Keeling Islands is that next time you plan to sail to a tropical island with your own personal harem, if upon your arrival you are unexpectedly greeted by numerous single sailors, keep your harem on your boat and keep on sailing. Well, one of our most well-received pieces was when we created a game that people could play in their cars while traveling through central Pennsylvania. Might seem like an odd pretense, but there's a method to our madness. If you were to travel from Canada to Key West, you, would, you could get from Niagara Falls to the Keys without ever leaving expressways, except for one 72 mile stretch in Pennsylvania. Because it is only opportunity for commercial establishments to lure in potential customers without drivers having to take the expressway off-ramp options, the stretch is populated by a plethora of shops selling sorted sex, frantic fireworks, and Native American artifacts. Sure, billboards are nice, but when Clyde Peeling's Reptile Land is right there by the side of the road, don't the kids have a much better chance of talking you into a stop? And if you happen to make your way to the snack bar, here's our inside tip. The cafe at Clyde's doesn't show up on Pennsylvania's list of five star restaurants, but for what it's worth, we hear the deep fried gator nuggets are to die for. At any rate, here's our opening paragraph for the feature that we titled, Deb and Tim's Totally Twisted Route 15 Fun Foray. All right. If you've ever fantasized about dressing up like an Indian and having sex under the fireworks, then for you, Route 15 south of Williamsport, Pennsylvania might just be a little slice of heaven right here on earth. Since we know we've just nailed your sexual fantasies to a T, we're sure that some of you are wondering how we've managed to peek into your bedroom window or hack into your computer. Well, don't feel bad. When it comes to sex, the Indian fireworks thing has been on our top 10 list for many moons. One of the more unique rock and roll legends in circulation is the connection between Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album and the classic 1937 film, The Wizard of Oz. We're sure a portion of you might be familiar with the storyline, but if you're not, here's the scoop. 
if you correctly cue up the beginning of the movie with the beginning of the album, there's a truly amazing array of connections between the lyrics of the album and the action in the film. Pivotal scenes early appear to coincide with the end of one track and the beginning of the next. So did Pink Floyd intentionally sync their Dark Side of the Moon album to the Wizard of Oz movie, or was it just one crazy coincidence? It's a great topic to explore because there is not an ironclad yes or no answer to the question, but either way, it provides a tantalizing piece of entertainment. In our book, we supply a website where you can access the movie synced up to the Pink Floyd soundtrack and a timeline specifying what to look for. All right, so of the 36 spots we point out in the movie, here are our top three. At the eight minute and two second mark, the matching transition is so spot on that for many people, it becomes the breakthrough moment, forcing the real realization that you're on to something special here. Just as Judy Garland's classic rendition of Somewhere Over the Rainbow fades out, there is a striking simultaneous convergence. Just as you see Elvira Gulch feverishly pedaling her bicycle, the soundtrack immediately shifts to the jarring sound of blasting chimes and alarms in the song Time. This example, which we'll show you in a moment, stands out because not only is the timing perfect, the mood of the action and the tone of the music are totally reflective of one another. At the 1931 mark, you see one extremely effective technique employed in the cinematography of The Wizard of Oz, which was the transition from the black and white sepia film for all the Kansas footage, which bookends the film, and the beautiful Technicolor film for all of the Oz footage. So this point in the film is always a breathtaking one, and it's also certainly a pinnacle in the Oz Pink Floyd concept, providing yet another example of where a shift in the movie scene coincides in dramatic perfection with a new song starting on the album. This transition to color is, again, absolutely spot on perfect. After the spinning house has crashed, Dorothy gets up and cautiously makes her way toward the door. As she tentatively opens it, upon the first glimpse of color in the film, you hear the first cash register, ka the opening note of the song, Money. For the record, no pun intended, Money was the only hit single from the album, peaking at number 13 in 1972. Now, just watch and listen. At the 4240 mark, the album ends as it begins with a heartbeat. As the heartbeat fades away, Dorothy puts her ear to the Tin Man's chest, listening for his heartbeat. Here's that footage. We'll give you one more visual display of this by showing you the footage of the first example we just described a moment ago. As Julie, Judy Garland is fading out on Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the Pink Floyd album is fading out from one song to another. So there is a second or two of silence in both the movie and the album. Then notice how precisely Pink Floyd begins banging and clanging the very second Elvira Gulch comes on the screen pedaling her bicycle like a mad woman. Since high school, we have always been bona fide Beach Boy fans. Collectively, we've seen them well over 100 times and know the band members, some better than others. Tim's initial connection with the Beach Boys was established in the early 1980s when in his capacity of being our town's recreation director, he submitted a photo to the band, which they decided to use on the inside cover of one of their albums. The picture features 45 kids from our town's summer rec program laying out on beach towels, spelling out the band's iconic logo. Things gradually expanded from there, and we'll fast forward three decades to our most bodacious Beach Boys binge. 
During the summer of 2015, as concert dates were gradually announced, a summer tour came together where we were going to be seeing the band on four days in four different states. Fours are wild. Now, the states were all in New England, so once we got there, the daily travel was not as significant as you might have suspected. The actual state order was Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. The third afternoon turns out to be one of the most memorable of our lives. We find ourselves sitting in the ocean at the Newport Beach Yacht Club on a hot summer day, sipping coconut vodka with the Beach Boys. When they hear the details of our four-day, four-state travelogue, they thank us for our dedication and support and tell us that since we have been made the effort to, to go four by four, they wanted to make five for five, and they bless us with front center tickets for what will be our fifth concert in five days. Serves up. One of our chapters is called Hoping for High Holidays, where we share a story on all the big ones. There's one quirky holiday where nobody does it better than Western New York. So we're going to take our home field advantage and share this story about Dingus Day, which falls every year on the Monday after Easter. The holiday began in 966 AD to celebrate the fact that the King of Poland had converted to Christianity. It's a holiday that to some degree is celebrated all around the world and throughout the United States. To provide you with our best one sentence summary of this holiday, Dingus Day is to Poland what St. Patrick's Day is to Ireland. Just like everybody's Irish on St. Patrick's Day, everybody's Polish on Dingus Day, but the green beer is replaced by red vodka. But for a quirky set of circumstances, which we outline in the book, the biggest Dingus Day celebration in the world takes place in Buffalo, New York. To use an analogy which appropriately takes advantage of the food for which the city is most known, Buffalo has taken Dingus Day under its wings. By happenstance, we ironically and fortunately find ourselves in prime position to provide precise firsthand coverage. All right, so while strolling the streets amongst the 100,000 people who attend annually, we observe the romantic Dingus Day foreplay consisting of girls whipping boys with wet pussy willows amidst the simultaneous exchange of ejaculated Easter water from squirt bottles and guns. We could draw you a roadmap of the sexual euphemisms conveyed by this imagery, but we're thinking you can probably pretty much connect those dots on your own. We go every year, so we have some inside stories to share and if you want to hear the best outside story, go to YouTube and queue up Anderson Cooper Dingus Day. Well, we live about 90 minutes from Niagara Falls and over the years have made the trip dozens of times, mostly to see concerts. In navigating Niagara Falls, there are multiple mentions of folks going over the falls in a barrel. A few years ago, we were motivated to research the history of this topic and write about it. First off, let's establish some parameters. In an historical analysis of all the people who have ever gone over Niagara Falls, you can basically divide them into three categories, suicides, victims who were swept over by accident, and daredevils who went over on purpose. Our discussion here is going to focus solely on those individuals who fall into that third category above. Um, here's a quick overview for you. Beginning with Annie Edson Taylor in 1903, Daredevils have made 17 attempts to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel or some other device. 16 different people have made the attempt, and the reason these numbers don't match exactly is that some people tried it more than once, and some people went over with partners. So we're sure a question going through your head right now is that if you decide to become the 17th person to give this thing a go, what are your odds of survival? Actually, they might be a little bit higher than you'd expect, with 10 of the 16 folks in the Barrel Brigade having survived the plunge. If you're a numbers geek, that comes out to 62.5%. The complete stories are in the book, and here are some related number nuances. Three people went over twice, and there are a couple of two-person pair plunging teams. Those crazy-ass people were all white, except for one. Two were women, and PWDM, two people actually went over with their pets. In addition to the ever popular barrel contraption, the free fall has been attempted with a kayak, a jet ski, and a big bouncing rubber ball. And believe it or not, one dude actually went over with nothing at all. We'd love to show you a picture of that last one, but unfortunately none exists, although there could have been video. We tell this tale in a segment titled, Worst Drinking Game Ever. Here's the long story short. 
group of guys are drinking at an outcrop on the Canadian side, just north of the falls. One party or Kirk Jones agrees to jump into the falls and go over if his friends are willing to tape the effort on their video camera. What follows may be our greatest example ever of irony. Without any barrel or protective system whatsoever in place, Kurt actually survives the plunge, but his friends are too drunk to get the camera working in time. Two thoughts on this. Number one, for obvious reasons, Kurt needs a new group of hangout buddies. And number two, upon reuniting with his friends, imagine the excruciating look on his face when his alleged can cameraman informs him, hey, Kurt, uh, I hate to say this, but we need a do-over. Switching gears. As we mentioned before, Tim taught high school English for 33 years, and it is not unusual for us to run into former students who are anxious to convey how impactful he was on their lives. All right, so in a related story, on the morning of July 3rd, 2017, we received an email informing us that Scott Reese, one of my former students, was dying of cancer, and his family reached out to us to see if we could use our connections to score tickets for him to see his favorite group, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, who were performing the following night at CMAC in Canandaigua. Fortunately, we were able to come through for them, and the entire backstory is one of the few tear-jerking components of our book. What follows below is an inspired paragraph we wrote after having made all the necessary arrangements with the outdoor venue director, Heather, and walking up to the top of the hill to take it all in as we waited for Scott's arrival. As we contemplated the obituary we know we would be soon writing, the following paragraph formulated in our brains as we looked over Canandaigua Lake, which is the backdrop of this concert venue. And this is what we came up with. As the shimmering sun serenely sets on the summer shoreline, we watch the cacophony of cascading colors create a Canandaigua crescendo as they reflect off the water. This is, Heather says, one of my favorite things to do if everything down below is copacetic. As the three of us stand at the very top of the hill overlooking the lake, it becomes a transcendent moment. The Seneca Indians bestowed the name Canandaigua upon the setting because in their words, it meant the chosen place. For this brief moment, frozen in time, there is a great spirit enveloping us with the realization that the Senecas chose wisely. If you happen to have been connecting the dots on this timeline, you may have already realized the double irony of this storyline. Within two months, Scott Reese and Tom Petty would both be dead. Always remember, you can't, you don't have to live like a refugee. We did a piece about the murder of Captain William Morgan, who was killed by the Masons in 1826 for revealing some of the secret society's secrets. That one backfired on the fraternal organization as a wave of anti-Masonic sentiment swept the country. It's an interesting story, but not one we chose to include in the book because in all honesty, it's kind of a downer. Our Masonic research, however, did inspire us to wax poetic on a dandy little bit of rhyme and verse, which we've entitled The Masons on a Roll Call. After consulting multiple lists of famous Masons, we compiled a roster of those we thought worthy of inclusion in our Hall of Fame roll call. We avoided fixation on the total number, but did think it would be cool if we came up with something round like 50 or 100. As it turned out, our initial recruiting rally resulted in exactly 75 names, which we thought was round enough. So here's our premise. If you could somehow combine heaven and earth for what would be the most secret meeting ever and get all these dudes in one room, we'll provide the roll call to make sure the gang's all here. If you're a Mason and you're hearing your name called, please stand up. So here's the Mason's honor roll call. The following verses include a brief shout out to the most famous Masons in history. All right, so in no particular order, here is your Mason's Hall of Fame that we wrote. Let the roll call begin. The Washingtons, they were key. We had George and Booker T. Colonel Sanders sure could cook. Kipling wrote the Jungle Book. Comedy had Richard Pryor. Lindbergh, he kept flying higher. Bill Garfield had his politics. Houdini did his magic tricks. The Marquis de Lafayette, Benedict Arnold, we regret. Andrew Jackson was so manly, Livingston we presume, but not Stanley. James McKinley, he got shot. Gerald Ford almost, but not. Midnight Ride by Paul Revere, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver here. Judge Earl Warren shall adjourn. General MacArthur shall return. 
Cy Young's arm was one true cannon. 15th Pres was James Buchanan. Mel Blake, man of a thousand voices, Bugs and Daffy, favorite choices. Lewis and Clark did sally forth, blaze their way out west and north. Worked so hard, he rarely clocked in. James Monroe did write a doctrine. Scotty Pippen's moves were cruel. Aaron Burr, he won the duel. John J. Astor, big wheel. Hoops legend, Shaq O'Neal. Adam Sandler, tell a joke. 11th Prez was James K. Polk. Ray Acuff, he wore cowboy boots. Alex Haley, he wrote Roots. Clark Gable, he stayed calm. Truman dropped atomic bomb. Thurgood Marshall, thank the Lord. Walter Chrysler, Henry Ford. J. Edgar Hoover, always ready. Roosevelt's Frank and Teddy. Musicians always having fun. Mozart and Duke Ellington. Charles Mayo built a clinic. Andrew Johnson, total cynic. Charles Hilton, he had money. That Don Rickles, he was funny. Richard Byrd found the North Pole. After that came Nat King Cole. Sam Houston and Jim Bowie. Texans both, yip, yip, yahooey. Count Basie had some hits. Winston Churchill led the Brits. Joe Frazier, he was Black's son. So, of course, was Jesse Jackson. Glenn Ford, quite a fellow. Abbott was, but not Costello. King George IV, Steve Wozniak, Franklin says he wants his kite back. Founding father was John Hancock, Conan Doyle, he wrote Sherlock. At quarterback, we got John Elway, Dempsey Boxed, and Sugar Ray. Buzz Aldrin in his rocket, Kit Carson, Davy Crockett. King Edward VII, Mark Twain, King William IV, John Wayne. Michael Richards, Seinfeld's vent, William Taft was president. Oscar Wilde, he was gay. Hawaiian King, Kalakaway. And of course, there are several others. Add all seven Ringling Brothers. All right, next we will share with you what was one of our favorite concluding paragraphs. The topic of the piece was the 1969 hoax that Beatle Paul McCartney had died in a car accident and then replaced in the band by a lookalike. Of course, it wasn't true, but there was a few month long fall frenzy that year where the planet was perplexedly paralyzed by the preposterous proposition purported about poor, poor, pitiful Paul. Of course, adding an element of interest to this storyline was the fact that the Beatles collectively denied culpability in the collaboration of clues which fanned the fire fueling the hoax. That being said, those British boys are sometimes full of Irish blarney. Beginning with the Sgt. Pepper album in 1967, the preponderance of clever, cleverly included clues seems to confirm that the Fab Four was having some fun with their fans, including us. We close this piece with the following paragraph. We wrote, we were totally immersed in the frenzy when we were in high school and the story was initially breaking. As a matter of fact, the storyline overlapped precisely with the months that we were first dating, serving to create the perfect double bonus. It gave us something to talk about before we started having sex. That was a good thing because we've rarely spoken to each other since. <laughs> All right, our, our last chapter in the book has some sports stories and we're going to pick our favorite one of those to close out our presentation tonight. This story features some characters from the 1950s New York Yankees and those teams did have some characters. The Yankees of this era were known for their hard play both on and off the field. And three men who were known to be at the top of that era's party list were Mickey Mantle, Whitey Ford, and Billy Martin. This story takes place on one of the team's rare and cherished off days during the long, grueling season. On this day, the trio has made plans to go hunting on a large wooded property owned by one of Mantle's friends in the Poconos. After a two hour drive, Mantle turns his car into the driveway of his friend's ranch, parks by a cow pasture, and tells Ford and Martin to sit tight while he goes into touch base with the owner. Once inside, the owner reviews with Mantle the logistics of his property and where the men should go to hunt. Well, Mantle has hunted the property before, so there's really nothing news breaking about what the owner shares with him. But as Mantle turns to go, the owner, his friend, does have one last rather unusual request. He says, listen, when you go back to your car, you'll see one old horse in the cow pasture. I've had her for 25 years. She's crippled with arthritis. I need to put her down. 
and I can't bring myself to do it, would you take care of that for me? I'd, I'd appreciate it. Well, taken aback a bit, but wanting to do what he can for his friend, Mantle agrees to fulfill the request. On his way back to the car, a practical joke occurs to Mantle. Upon returning to Billy Martin and Whitey Ford, Mantle unleashes a profanity-ridden tirade of intentional fabrications, the gist of which is that his friend has changed his mind and after taking hours to drive to the Poconos, his friend has told him that they will not be allowed to hunt. You know what I'm gonna do, Mantle says to his friends? I'm gonna shoot that damn bastard's horse. At that point, Mantle follows through on his friend's request, firing one accurate shot to put the crippled horse down. Immediately thereafter, Mantle hears two more shots ring out and Billy Martin screaming, let's get the hell out of here. I just shot two of his cows. That concludes our presentation on our second book, Tip for Tat Exchanges, Tim and Deb's Greatest Hits. We'll share a slide with our contact information and book availability and open the floor up to any questions. Well, that, that was absolutely fantastic, Tim and Deb. I, I got to say, I uh, I heard that story before, and every time I hear it, I still laugh. And I should add, I believe I have those baseball cards that you showed. <laughs> well, that was great. I, you know, I was struck by a number of things, uh, probably too many to mention. But the uh, the first thing I'll ask, just is more just a logistical kind of thing, and. You, you know, you're having your teaching background, especially in English, it's not surprising that you would write. But what was the first thing that you remember writing for either of you? Well, I have, um, going way back, the thing that I wrote to my mother on Mother's Day 1962. It's framed. It's framed and up in our, our dressing room. I gave it to her when she was still alive. So it was kind of cool in that regard. But, um, you know, the... the during the 90s, when I was doing my work with animation, I wrote for a few different animation magazines then. But the big difference between that and now that, you know, I've shared with different people, like back then when my things would come out in these magazines, um, people would say, you know, I mean, this is great that you're getting all this stuff published. You must really love writing, don't you? You know, and I would think about it. And my answer was, you know what? It's, it's not so much. I don't love writing. I love having written. You know, there's the sense of satisfaction when you finish something and you know it's really good, but the process was arduous. It was work. So that's the difference between then and now. When Deb and I write, I mean, there's times when we sit around at night in front of our keyboard putting stuff together and we're just laughing our butts off at each other. And it's the process is enjoyable now as opposed, well, in, as, in addition to the finished product. And I guess for me, um, in school, I wrote a lot of curriculum and I know it's totally different than what we do now, but throughout it, I would have to teach teachers and administrators how to use it. And I always use animation. In fact, every year the kids would put on a little skit and say, you know, you, you, you just are so funny when you're teaching because, but that's what I think ends up going in here too, is that personality of make it interesting, make it fun, make it animated. Did you guys collaborate on writing prior to doing your, your articles for the Sentinel? There was a couple things we did together in high school, like remember the Vincent Van Gogh? Oh, yeah. We did yeah. <laughs> a, a report and presentation to the class, class on Vincent Van Gogh that had a, a writing component. So we did, you know, collaborate on a few writing pieces way back in the day. I see. You know, did I did I ever tell you that I um I hated English? <laughs> I, was, I was a science guy so you know English was the exact opposite of what I wanted and uh, one time I I had to do a, a, a report on a book you know a novel did you ever assign your students reports on novel they had to do a, an, an analysis of a novel oh yeah yeah did they like it pardon I, um, some yes some no I hated it I hated it this was in 10th grade and I got 10 of my fellow students to refuse to do it. And it was working for a while until the teacher said, well, you know, I'm going to give you a choice. You're either going to do the analysis or you're going to write your own novel. Well, the other nine did the analysis. I stood fast and I decided I was going to write my own novel. 
it was really bad. I still have it. You can read it one of these days. But <laughs> teacher came back and he said, you know, and remember, I'm a science guy. I hate writing. I hate reading. I hate English. Said, you know, you got you got an interest. You, you're going to have a career in writing. And I was really I was almost insulted that he said that. So I haven't I haven't talked to him. Uh, he's still around, I think. So I should probably ask him what he thinks. Did so you, did you did who you, thought you'd end up writing your thing every week for the paper? I know. And, and more. Who, did you ever have a student like that who hated writing and ended up going into writing or something similar as a profession? Uh, I don't have any knowledge of that particular scenario having played out for me. Hmm. What was the... I have a story for you. And this go ahead, go ahead. Is, I taught um, college math, and then I also taught um, grades three through six in Virginia Beach Public Schools. Well, every month there was a citizen of the, mo citizen of the month in your classroom. And they'd had this big luncheon and it would just be all decorated and everything. Well, I decided what the kids in other classrooms did, they, they voted on people. Well, I had my kids each write about themselves and why they deserve to be citizen of the month. So if I, it was me, well, my name is Deb Smith. And I mean, they literally poured their hearts into wise and make it a persuasive paragraph. Why do you deserve to be this classroom's citizen of the month? Well, I remember a couple of people saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And I said, well, you know what? That's okay. We're going to do it for you. So the kids and I would get together and I'd write all the stuff on the board. And they, Chris, they just, they couldn't wait for Citizen of the Month to tell about themselves and why they deserve. They were not just learning to write persuasive paragraphs, but they were feeling good about themselves. Yeah, I guess I am really good at this. So that was something that I encouraged them to do, and it really worked. They loved it. Hence, the lesson that every good salesperson should know. It's never about the product. It's always about you, the customer. So you got your students to not worry about what the lesson was. You got them to be more excited about themselves, yeah. and the lesson came through that. That's that's brilliant. Okay. So I, I had a, another question that... Uh, that I was wondering, and that is, so you've done all these different articles, and I know some of them were captured in tit for tat exchanges. Was there one in particular that just stands out as the the most unexpected story that you came across? Well, if I had to pick one, I'll, I, I know what mine would be off the bat. And this this has been in the paper, so this will ring a bell. There was. Um, now we had a, there's that picture of us back in high school and we've got that Melanie album, right? On our laps that we're reading the lyrics to when we're in like juniors in high school. And so then we recreated the picture a couple summers ago, same album, got the old fashioned aluminum web chairs, did the pose, did the whole thing. Um, you know, so had that background and then we saw her a couple times, talked to her a couple times, but the one quirkiest thing was we went to see her in Buffalo and we had seen three, we had three concerts in three days. It was almost Queen in Rochester in that party in the park thing they do. Then the Beach Boys at Canandaigua and then Melanie in Buffalo. Well, at the Queen thing, there, there was yellow wristbands to get into like, if you paid extra money, there was like a little VIP thing where you could get closer to the stage. So we had done that. And we still had our wristbands on from that when we went to, to Melanie. Melanie. And so when you went to this venue in Buffalo, if you, it was kind of, there was a restaurant bar on one side and then a concert thing outside. And to get to, into the concert thing, you had to have a wristband on and it was, it was orange, orange, right? So we had our orange wristband and we got there early, got sat as close as we could. There was some seats in front that were reserved, but we were only about 15 feet away from her. Um, but talk to her son and he was talking about, well, you know, you guys will get to see her after the show. And we're thinking, how in the world is this going to happen? And there's a few other things in there, but I will give you the shortened version. The The show ends and, and we don't know how we're supposed to see her because we had stuff that we wanted to have her sign. So we walk back inside the building, ask, you know, if you're supposed to see Melanie after this, where do you go? And the guys point us towards um, the, side room. The, the side room. And there's two guys there like monitoring who's coming and going. And as we go to walk in, we hear them 
saying something about wristbands, but we didn't, you know, couldn't figure out what exactly they were talking about. And then the one guy says, well, she's the lady that was right up on stage with her for a while. They're okay. You know, so we walk into this thing, get inside there and start, and there's this big expensive buffet laid out about 15 people. And as we're picking up on these conversations, we had just walked into what was a, it was $250 per person, a meet and greet thing. And the people that had the meet and greet got a yellow wristband. And the one that we still had on from Queen Friday night was close enough that along with the other things that had fallen into place, we, you know, without even knowing, it was we did a thing about alchemy. We turned two $5 or five cent wristbands into a $500 VIP. And package. we got free wine the whole night. It was like, because of those wristbands. It was crazy. And we just, we didn't even eat. We did not, not just feeling guilty, but we were like, oh, I can't believe we're going to sit here and talk to her. And it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think that's, uh, we're coming close on our, on our, on our end here. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to add before we wrap things up? No, I think we're good. We enjoy doing these. Well, I, I enjoyed next, listening. I'm excited about our next book. It's um, What's in a Name? And what's most exciting to us, not just the book, but the cover was designed by an HFL uh, student. And it's wonderful. Excellent. Well, we can't wait for that. Well, thank you guys for being part of today's wonderful evening. And thank you, everybody who's listening either now or in the future. We're going to be back with more. So stick around. Bye-bye, folks. Thanks, Bye. boss. Thank you.